Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm going to be giving a, an introduction looking at the context of our Tudor coursework which focuses uh, on rebellions in the Tudor period and I'm going to talk about some of the themes that we'll look at and give give you a bit, bit of background, a bit of uh, a starting point in terms of some of the ideas you need to be thinking about and introducing uh, the different monarchs as well. So we're going to focus on um, rebellion and disorder under the Tudors uh, 1485 through to 1603. So starting with Henry VII going all the way through uh, to the end of Elizabeth's reign. So this will involve looking at a whole range of different rebellions that take place across the time period. However, there are rebellions in every single uh, year and this will leave you with gaps. And in those gaps, you need to, to look into to long term causes of rebellions. Uh, why there was disorder and discontent in, in England in, in, a, in a kind of more general way. So it can't just be a, a kind of a story of, of picking out the different rebellions. It has to be a kind of an overarching um, view of why there were rebellions, why there was disorder, why there was discontent in, in the Tudor world. Uh, you will be comparing uh, different different themes uh, across across time, um, looking at the impact of religion, of social and economic problems, and and of political opposition. So those who who don't want the Tudors uh, in power, uh, and or, or or disprove of Tudor policy and, uh, and Tudor ministers. The importance of the of these different themes will fluctuate across the different Tudor monarchs and between the different rebellions. So just because you you find one rebellion that is overwhelmingly um, religious in its cause, that doesn't defeat the argument um, that, that the causes uh, in some areas lie elsewhere. This is um, uh, the question that we're, we're looking at doing at the moment. So to what extent were rebellions in Tudor England, which is 1485-1603, motivated by social and economic problems? And so that will be the focus. And then there will, what you would then do is compare it against the other factors. So if you've talked about the kind of the political factors and the religious factors as well, you're going to write a, an extended essay on this. It, it, it's going to um, be a maximum of four and a half thousand words. You're going to reference it. You're going to have to use primary sources. You're going to have to, to, to look into the views of different historians. So the, the Tudor monarchs, very, very briefly, I'll, I'll look at these in a bit more detail later in the video. So you've got Henry VII who seizes power in 1485 at the Battle of, Bo Battle of Bosworth uh, and he, he uh, reigns till 1509 when he dies and, he, and he's replaced by his son. So he, he's most notable for, for ending the War of the Roses, bringing stability and increased, uh, increased kind of financial security to the crown and, and securing the power of the monarch because the power of the monarchy had declined during the War of the Roses. His son Henry VIII, far more famous than, he, than his father, became king in 1509 when he was only 17. Uh, he's renowned for being obsessed with, with, with succession and having six wives and, and for splitting England from the Catholic Church. Uh, and uh, when it financed and everything else, he spent all his dad's money uh, on war, essentially. Henry VI the, uh, the was um, the only... Uh, only son of Henry VIII and he became uh, the next king but he was only nine he was very strongly Protestant he he, he only reigns for five years he dies when he's 15. Uh, Mary uh, the eldest child uh, of Henry VIII um, she reigned from 1553 to 1558 she was strongly Catholic uh, she earned the name uh, Bloody Mary for persecution of Protestants uh, and she married uh, Philip of Spain but failed to have any children that meant that the crown then passed uh, to her sister or half-sister Elizabeth who um, reigned from 1558 to 1603 so the longest of the Tudor reigns famously known or referred to as the Virgin Queen because she never married she was Protestant, but not uh, maybe not as radically Protestant as uh, uh, her younger half brother Edward, and she oversaw a, a golden age in in, in England uh, and defeated the Spanish Armada or or four, and and, and it generally considered it to be a, a very successful monarch. All of these monarchs, however, um, faced rebellion and discontent and disharmony uh, within England. One of the, the root causes, and this is going to be our central one for, for uh, uh, this essay, was uh, social and economic problems. So popular discontent amongst the ordinary people is often rooted in economic problems. Now, some of these run all the way through uh, and you'll, you'll keep coming back to them as an, as an underlying cause in some of the rebellions. Uh, so enclosure 
is one of them. So this is when uh, land is fenced off by landowners preventing others from using it. Um, they, they were often enclosing land that was considered by the local people to be to be common land, land that they, they had traditionally always had access to. Uh, and enclosure led not only to this loss of land so it's for people's use, but it also led to changing farming practices um, and led to less uh, demand for farm labour. So, so, for example, more likely uh, to, lay, uh, to raise livestock, but also it actually made the growing of crops more efficient and, and therefore you didn't need quite as many labourers to produce as, many, as much crops. Uh, and this was quite a central issue in, in, in the growing gap between rich and poor in Tudor England. Um, the, the landowner who enclosed the land would generally um, make then go on to make more money and become more wealthy, but the the, the poor in the, that that area would then often lose work, uh, and so it would become poorer. Uh, and enclosure is quite a difficult one for in, from a historical point of view because in terms of social impact, it, it has really quite a, a negative one on people at the time. But in terms of economic development, actually. It's more more effective than the old three field system that had been in place before. Another major uh, economic problem for for the people in Tudor England was inflation. Uh, rising prices were generally not matched by rising wages, and this was le leading to to falling living standards and increased poverty amongst a, a large part of the Tudor population. And again, the falling living standards is a, a reason that caused people to to dislike the monarchy and to, and to rebel against uh, the various Tudor monarchs. Another key issue was care for the poor and sick. Uh, dissolution of the monasteries under Henry VIII uh, was not only uh, a religious issue, it, it also got rid of these monasteries um, that had played a major role uh, in, in the lives of the, the English people. They, they played a role in caring for the poor and for the sick. Um, it, so that has a big impact we are, and, and is a reason why there is resistance to the dissolution of monasteries. And we see this in the Pilgrimage of Grace, which is one of the key rebellions. There were also changes to, to, to laws relating to the poor, often referred to them as poor laws, and, and, and these led to kind of locally people had to, to, to give money to look after the poor, and so people tended to drive beggars and vagrants, as they called them, out of their villages or towns, so they didn't have to support them. Um, we see an underlying demographic issue that is massively significant in the Tudor world, which is a massive, massive increase in population. Um, and this this leads to uh, an increased demand for food uh, and and there's really for, for one of the first times in England a, a kind of real explosion of, of urban growth as well and that caused a whole new kind of um, set of, of, of social and economic problems. Uh, demographically the Tudor population is, is, is very very different to uh, the population in, in, in the modern world. I mean they, they've complained about overcrowding which we, we would look at with great surprise because the population was tiny uh, compared to, to, um, to, to the modern day so we're talking about kind of four and a half million people by the end. Um, so it, it sounds like a, a, a tiny group of people but the other big demographic difference is the Tudor population was really really young um, so you don't you, you you have you don't have huge numbers of people living into old age. Population is growing, which means there's lots and lots of young people. So that might in some ways explain the 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 way that people react to different things. Religion is is a really really important issue in this time period. Uh, at the start of the Tudor period in Henry the uh, Seventh reign, the humanist ideas started to spread through England. Um, but essentially, it, England in, in the time of Henry VII is Catholic. Um, in, in Henry VIII's reign, we see some hugely significant changes in terms of religion. Now, early on, he, he really clearly is, is very committed to Catholicism. He, he wrote a book attacking the ideas of, of, of uh, Martin Luther and earned the title Defender of the Faith from the Pope. Again, very unusual for a, an English king to be writing a book. But and 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 to be writing on religious issues and show his commitment to the Catholic Church it, it is particularly odd given what happens with Henry later in his reign because later in his reign he splits with Rome um, and we see significant changes which have had very long lasting impact with Henry VIII becoming the, the head of the, the Church of England and, and that's been carried on with all monarchs ever since uh, and we saw him his dissolution of the monasteries so essentially shutting down the monasteries um, in, the, there were no longer going to be monks and, and, and nuns in England 
uh, arguably he never actually personally became Protestant, but there, it did. This change did allow in some some Protestant ideas, uh, and his his son. Uh, Edward Edward seen uh, um Edward was raised by largely by the Seymour family his his um his mum's family Jane Seymour uh, and he he grew grew up and to become a, a committed Protestant I say grew up I mean he became king when he was nine and died when he was fifteen but one area where we historians generally think he did intervene and he did really push his agenda uh, was over Protestantism in fact. His, his own uncle falls um, falls from power largely we think because he's he's not pushing the religious agenda as hard as Edward wants and he's replaced by Jacob Northumberland who does push it harder so we see some fairly strong Protestant changes and under Edward which are not universally popular is that most of the population is uh, is Catholic and therefore there's rebellions against Edward notably at uh, the Western Rebellion also known as the prayer book rebellion that shows that discontent caused by religious changes. So Mary, his elder half-sister who replaces him, was resolutely Catholic uh, and earned the name uh, Bloody Mary for, for burning Protestants alive. So we can see under Mary that, that religion is an issue. I mean, she marries uh, a, a Catholic king in, 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 uh, in the form of Philip from Spain. Uh, and if Mary and Philip had had children, then, then England would have um, continued as a Catholic country. She changed it back from being a Catholic country uh, and, and restored the papal supremacy. But she was um, replaced by her younger half-sister Elizabeth, who was a Protestant, maybe not as, maybe in a fairly moderate Protestant for this term uh, at this period of time. But she, this what, what this meant for Elizabeth is that she faced opposition both from Catholics, who, who really wanted to get rid of her, and some of the more extreme Protestants who, who disliked her religious settlement and some of the religious changes that she brought in. Not not that they disliked Protestantism, but they don't didn't think they went far enough. And and we, we'll see things like uh, the the Presbyterians and the Puritan movement uh, that that oppose uh, Elizabeth as well. So religion it, it forms a, an important part of discontent. Political opposition uh, and, and challenges to royal authority are another important element of it. Um, so Henry VII was of the House of Lancaster uh, and he defeated Richard III, who was of the House of York at the Battle of Bosworth, and it's just seen as, as, as the last battle of, of the, the War of the Roses, so where, which had been fought between the Lancaster and York uh, over the previous period. Um, and Henry does some quite clever stuff to try and, and secure his position. So um, he married Elizabeth of York, who was of the House of York and had the best blood claim to the throne, actually, of anybody. Um, uh, Henry faced Yorkist opposition throughout his reign, even though some of his those who were opposing him were, were actually pretenders. So we're going to see uh, Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck a, a, a kind of key people involved in the rebellions against Henry the Seventh, and, and that that's largely it's, it's, it's about political opposition these are people who are trying to remove the House of Lancaster from the throne. Um, Henry the Eighth at first faced a uh, very little challenge to his position uh, his father had, had established the, the throne and he, he became uh, became king uh, but, but during his great matter, this did create opposition and faction. His chief ministers, notably Wolsey and Cromwell, also had a large number of enemies, and they, this caused a lot of the opposition. Uh, Edward saw political intrigue um, about who could gain control of the king, because you've got a king who's, who's a child. Uh, and we see, therefore, we see coups and counter coups uh, under the Dukes of Somerset and Northumberland. Political opposition continued into the reigns of Mary and Elizabeth. So Elizabeth saw political opposition over her marriage to Philip of Spain. We see this in Wyatt's Rebellion. Uh, Elizabeth based for, uh, faced opposition based on her, on her decision not to marry and then also, also over uh, decisions about potentially marrying different people and factions developed at court uh, and within the country. Uh, at the end of her her reign, her authority was challenged directly by the Earl of Essex, uh, and and we we see this uh, with the Essex Rebellion. So the, as you can see, they, they were kind of um, really really creative with the naming of rebellions in a lot of this time. Though there is the odd exception, things like the Pilgrimage of Grace, which which, which is an unusual name for a rebellion, which happened under Henry VIII. Throughout this period, the Tudors struggled to maintain control of some of the regions in their realm. Uh, I mean, a notable area that I'd expect people to explore in, in looking at questions of, of Tudor rebellion would be things like Ireland, which was a, a, a particular issue. 
uh, and there were there were also various other parts, outlying parts of, of the English monarch's realm, in parts of England such as as, as Cornwall uh, and the North that posed particular difficulties uh, for the various Tudor monarchs in terms of maintaining control over them. So that in the heartlands near near the capital, the the, the Tudor Tudor grasp on power tended to be fairly strong. But if you went if you went out west or you went you went north, then that power that control. Uh, it was less it was less strong and, and the levels of, of discontent uh, were higher as well. Henry the seventh is is the first but not the best known of the Tudors. He's, he's actually really one of my, my favorite in English monarchs. I think he's, he's quite an interesting character Henry the seventh. Um, so he, he won the throne at the Battle of Bosworth so so he, he kind of has this uh, the military um, element to him and, and, and he, this is seen as as the end of the War of the Roses, though arguably it's another battle. Henry fights the Battle of East Stoke, which can be argued to be the last battle of the the War of the Roses. At Bosworth, he defeats Richard the Third, who's later on is attacked in in some uh, some strongly pro Tudor propaganda in Shakespeare's play Richard the Third, and and a lot of the way that the publicly. Richard III is perceived as being it, it all goes back to Shakespeare rather than uh, back to reality uh, and um, some of this has been uh, uh, been been kind of uh, brought up more recently when when the remains of Richard III were found um, underneath the car park in the Midlands. Um, Henry the Seventh had a very poor blood claim, and and this allows intrigue in terms of, of political opposition because it's it's not absolutely solidly that he is the person who should be king. It, though he's very very clever at securing his his um his marriage and and the power of the monarchy and he does this through marriage to Elizabeth of York, he he um spends a lot of time and effort reducing the power of the nobility, uh so the the nobility officer at this point referred to as over mighty subjects because what happened during the War of the Roses is the power of, of the nobility had risen and and the power of the monarchy had fallen. And so these nobles had essentially got used to controlling bits of the country themselves, not really paying much attention to whoever was king at the time. Uh, and, and, and Henry crushes their, their power of using acts of attainder and, and uh, later on saying, as the council led in the law and, and, and um, restrictions on retaining as in uh, keeping large staffs of, staff of, of supporters. And in, in through all the different policies he does, he makes them financially weaker and he makes himself stronger and richer. And 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 so in this, he he's, can be seen as a, as a very, um, a very clever king. Um, he's often seen as the miser king as well. And, and um, uh, the uh, the old nursery rhyme about the, the king is in the counting house, counting out his uh, money that that's about Henry the seventh. Uh, so he he brought a, a great deal of stability and secured the Tudor's place on the throne, and and therefore in terms of succession, most of his 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 son and then his grandkids are going to have a, a smoother ride in onto the throne than he did. Um, he was not universally loved, and therefore we, again we will see opposition and we will see rebellions. But he was an effective monarch who took personal charge of the ruling of his kingdom. Henry VIII, his son, is 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 uh, far better known. He reigned 1509 to 1547. Um, wasn't actually initially set up to be king. He's, he's, he should have been his elder brother Arthur, but Arthur's uh, untimely death led to, to Henry taking the throne. He, he is famous for um, his six wives and splitting England from the Catholic Church. Um, and in most people's mind, Henry is, is a big fat tyrant and, and images like the one above me on, on the screen is, is how most people see Henry. But that's only part of the story of Henry. Um, uh, Henry took the throne at, at 17 and was considered to be a very handsome, um, uh, intelligent Renaissance prince. He, he, he wrote music. He um, spoke many languages. He um, he was good at um, at sport that we might recognize things like tennis but he he was also um, really good at things like jousting and and, and so he he was kind of a, this kind of all action young king to start off with now he saw glory he he wanted uh, he wanted glory through war and foreign policy uh, and so so he didn't have the need to fight for his throne uh, like his father had but he wanted to prove himself uh, as a warrior king he would often leave a lot of the day-to-day -day running of the state to to kind of key ministers and we, we most of them seem to be called Thomas so we've got Thomas Wolsey we then had Thomas More and we have Thomas Cromwell 
Uh, and and there is a period at the end and a bit at the beginning where he doesn't have a, a, a kind of dominant minister. The bit at the end, it all becomes a bit messy and, and we end up with kind of political opposition or, or political factionalism uh, as people are fighting to over control of the um, largely bedroom king towards the end. Although associated very strongly with religious change, and therefore the the, the some of the rebellions in his his reign have a, have a very strongly kind of religious flavour, particularly the biggest one, uh, which is the Pilgrimage of Grace. He himself was was not not a Protestant, um, and this is is seen in some of the doctrinal changes which which he starts and then reverses, and also in his own behaviour on his own deathbed, for example. Um, and despite all his time obsessing with succession, he actually ended up leaving his throne to his nine year old son, Edward. Now, th this is, is going to, again, in terms of discontent and, and the chance of opposition and rebellions, is going to really lead into potential problems because you've got a minor uh, on the throne who, who is therefore seen as, a, uh, as being weaker and, and, and therefore making opposition and rebellion more likely. Henry, the, Henry's son Edward is often portrayed as a sickly boy. He, he took the throne at age nine, he died aged 15, and therefore you can see where that narrative would co to come through. Now, he wasn't actually ill throughout his life. There was no particular evidence that he was always sickly. I think he, the, the, he had a family that were massively overprotective of him and worried about every last thing because he was the only uh, living uh, male heir. Um, he was brought up to be strongly Protestant uh, and uh, and was uh, determined to have a truly Protestant country. Because remember, his father was split from the, the Catholic Church. We hadn't truly brought Protestant ideas in. Um, this is going to cause problems. And we'll see it in terms of the rebellions that he faced, because essentially he was Protestant, but the English people weren't. They were still largely Catholic. His reign is dominated by political infighting as well to a degree because to start off with he, his uncle Edward Seymour who be, makes himself Duke of Somerset it, it dominates and then he's removed and he's executed uh, he, his own his own, Edward Seymour had actually earlier executed his own brother um, Thomas Seymour after he'd accept, he tried to uh, kidnap the young uh, the young Edward so there, there's lots of kind of political intrigue uh, around this and, and maybe something you would expect with, with such a, a young king. Um, later in his reign, reign uh, the Duke of Northumberland became the key figure uh, and it was uh, Northumberland and Edward that created device uh, to make Lady Jane Grey Edward's heir instead of his sister. So he, he actually removes both Mary and Elizabeth um, for the throne and Lady Jane Grey does become queen, but she, she reigned for only uh, nine days. Uh, she, did, she did happen to be married to Northumberland's eldest son, Guilford Dudley. Um, historians differ on, on, on how much uh, this was down to Northumberland and how much this was down to um, uh, to Edward, so that that's an area of of debate. Edward's reign does have in it what often historians refer to as as the worst year in Tudor England, fifteen forty nine, in which there are two rebellions: uh, the Western Rebellion and Ketts Rebellion. And so you are likely to spend a disproportionate amount of time uh, looking at some of the stuff on Edward. Mary, um, the the daughter of Henry and um, uh, Catherine of Aragon. Um, she becomes a queen following um, the death of Edward and the uh, very short reign of Lady Jane Grey. Uh, she was an absolutely devoted Catholic and her devo devotion to her faith had brought into conflict, her into conflict with both her father and, and, over, and with her brother. Initially, she's kind of swept to power on, on, on a kind of a wave of public support. She married her, her cousin, uh, King Philip of Spain, um, and this did lead um, uh, to, to rebellion in the form of Wyatt's rebellion. Uh, Wyatt tried to um, to stop the marriage, uh, fearing uh, foreign domination of England. Uh, she's most famous for her persecution of the Protestants, of burn, burning Protestants at the stake, in an attempt to save their souls. Um, you know, she did do other things as well. So she, she brought in reforms to government uh, and tax and the Navy, all the results, all which benefited Elizabeth, but didn't really benefit her. She died of what we think is, is, is something like ovarian cancer. And she reluctantly uh, made Elizabeth her heir, 
Um, though she made Elizabeth promise to do things like maintaining the Catholic Church, which Elizabeth didn't do. So under Mary's reign, the Protestants are very, very unhappy, whilst under Edward, the Catholics were really unhappy. And then this leads us into Elizabeth and Elizabeth being in a slightly awkward position because there's been all this religious strife. So Elizabeth is renowned uh, as uh, a very intelligent and capable leader. She was the daughter of Henry and, and Anne Boleyn. And we, as I said before, she, she was posed with this very difficult um, situation where there'd been discontent on both, religious discontent on both sides. Now, she, she was by conviction a, a Protestant, uh, but she tried to find a, a middle way in religion. And the way why it was a middle way, it wasn't because it was actually Catholic. It wasn't. There, there were parts of Catholic practice which she kept, but essentially it was a Protestant church. But she said famously, or though, though whether she said these exact words is disputed, that she didn't want a window into men's souls. So if people were in belief Catholic, but they, they outwardly were compliant. They went to her church uh, every Sunday. They didn't make a big fuss. They didn't uh, they didn't um, decry her policies. Then she was perfectly happy. She she wasn't going to initially interfere if it all out. Now, things change a bit um, as we go through um, her reign, because uh, by towards the end of her reign, the word Catholic becomes synonymous with the word traitor. And there's Catholic plots to kill Elizabeth. Uh, and there is uh, some uh, some significant rebellions, notably the Northern Rebellion. Uh, and so religion is, is a difficult issue in Elizabeth's reign. It, it, what does happen is a, 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 what I think Elizabeth envisioned wouldn't happen. If she if she stayed on the throne long enough, then eventually the country would follow her because they'd have been going to her church and getting the messages that she wanted them to get. She was well served by a number of ministers, um, particularly um, Cecil and Leicester. Um, though with Lester, uh, Robert Dudley, she, she's rumoured to have been uh, more than just friends with him. And again, uh, a lot of speculation on that, but a lot of factionalism uh, along uh, around the way that uh, Lester, the, uh, Robert Dudley was, was treated at court. And those who joined him formed a faction around him and those who formed factions against him. Her reign saw, a, saw a, a golden age in terms of, of English history, and in, in terms of art and, and, and theatre and things like that. And, and also some great victories, such as the, the defeat of the Spanish Armada, though you can argue that was more to do with um, the weather in the English Channel than it was to do with anything brilliantly done by the English. And it also, she also oversaw great demographic change. It was it, the, the population explosion which had been happening throughout the Tudor period really accelerated um, through Elizabeth's reign. Historians often talk about a great deal of success in her first 30 years uh, on the throne and then 15 years where it, it goes quite horribly wrong towards the end. So she kind of the high point is is the defeat of the Armada uh, and the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, 86, 8, 87, 88. And then after that, we've we, we've got a, a, a real decline and maybe because you've got a monarch who's, who's aging and and it doesn't have an heir and therefore we start getting more political intrigue we see problems in ireland we we, we see essex's rebellion so th there's plenty to get, get your teeth in towards the end of her reign and she's she's finally uh, succeeded in 1603 by the son of mary queen of scots james who is who is already king in scotland um and it's a fairly smooth transition of power. And James had managed to stay on decent terms with, with Elizabeth, despite the fact that Elizabeth has executed his mother. Right. So that gives us a kind of an overview of some of the, the key bits in Tudor history. Thank you very much uh, for watching this. I really do recommend if you if you want to get more detail on on the dirts on Tudor, there is actually a separate um, Tudor playlist uh, on my channel uh, and and that will will help in terms of understanding the Tudors and, and I'll continue to add more to it but again the two Henrys uh, Edward and Mary there's, there's some really good coverage on them there's a bit of stuff on Elizabeth and and, and a lot more to follow on that there's also uh, the coursework playlist um, which goes through various bits of the skills that you need. And, and again, a lot more will be added to that, which will be spe more specific um, to this topic. There's lots of stuff in there. Some of it is generic, so it could help with any bit of coursework. 
and, and some bits which are which are aimed uh, at the other coursework topic uh, we do in my in my college, which is on um, anti-Semitism in Germany. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, do please hit like. Please share. If you think it'll be useful uh, with for other people. If you haven't done so already, um, then uh, uh, subscribe and have a look at my other playlist and see if there's other stuff that can help you, uh, particularly if you are studying A-level history. And there's also a load of stuff on there if you're doing A-level politics as well. Thank you very much for watching.